Welcome to Upgrade Your World, Microsoft Windows 10 for Nonprofits and Libraries. I'm glad to have you joining us today. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global, and I'm happy to be your host. Also joining us we have Anthony Kinsey from Microsoft. And I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's a software engineer at Microsoft, and he's played various roles working on Windows for the past few releases, ranging from market research to testing localized versions of Windows, and most recently to customer engagement on the Windows Insider team, where he leads engineering teams across the Windows and Devices group in their efforts to engage with, listen, and be responsive to your customers. And you can follow him at A. Kinsey MSFT, so like Microsoft. You'll also hear from Carlos Bergfeld who is one of our tech supers here. And he is a product content manager here where he writes and edits content for TechSoup's product donation program, helping nonprofits make informed technology decisions. So you'll hear from both of them today. You'll also see assisting with chat Ben Chasby and Ali Bezdikian both here at TechSoup. They'll be on hand to answer your questions in the chat throughout. We are here in our San Francisco TechSoup headquarters, and Anthony is up in Redmond, Washington at Microsoft. So go ahead and let us know from where you are joining today. And while you do that, I will do a quick overview of the agenda and an introduction of TechSoup. So we will talk a little bit about TechSoup uh, and our work here in case you are not familiar with us. Then we will hear from you, our audience, where uh, you are at with operating systems right now, what you are using. Then Anthony will take us through Windows 10 features and benefits and highlights of the new program, and you'll get to see it in a live demo as well. He'll talk a little bit about Upgrade Your World, which is a contest that's going to be running. Uh, it has been running, but it's going to be running again soon with local prizes awarded to countries or organizations, nonprofits in countries around the world, where you can have an opportunity to win $50,000 in grants from Microsoft. So that's exciting. And then Carlos will talk about Windows 10 upgrade paths and options. So depending on what you are using now, you may have a variety of options for upgrading totally for free uh, or through other options. And we'll talk about that later today. And then we'll have time for additional resources and Q&A. We have folks chatting in from all over the world, from Canada, North Carolina, Texas, New York, Iowa, Connecticut, Wisconsin, Florida, Arizona, Michigan, all over the place. So we're really glad to have you all joining us. Quickly, TechSoup is a global nonprofit network of 63 partner NGOs providing technology, knowledge, resources, and donations to organizations in 121 countries around the world. We serve 615,000 NGOs worldwide. You can see all these little green dots on the map and orange dots. That's where we have a presence. Green dots are where you can find local meetups to connect with local technology do-gooders and social change makers in your area. So if there's a dot near you, you can go to NetSquared and look for meetups that you can join. We serve those 615,000 nonprofits in a variety of ways, but the biggest of which is our donation programs that we run along with companies like Microsoft who donate their technology products to the social good sectors, nonprofits, libraries, foundations, charities, and churches to the tune of nearly $5 billion in grants and technology products. You can learn more about those programs at TechSoup.org. And we'll show you a little bit later on where you can access Windows 10 through those programs if you need access to it. So on with the topic of the day. Go ahead and let us know what operating system you are using right now. And that could be for your personal computer. That could be for your individual work machine. That could be for your organization overall. Maybe you are running a mixed bag of operating systems. Maybe you have a handful of machines that are running Vista or XP because they are compatible with um, some legacy software that needs to be compatible with that. And maybe you've moved up to 10 and you just want to see a little bit more about it and learn about some of the features you may not have discovered yet in your own use of it. So go ahead and click on which of these options make the most sense for you. And if there's something I didn't include, feel free to go ahead and chat it in the chat window. We have some folks commenting Windows 7, Windows 8 and 10, Windows 7 Pro, Mixed Bag, Mac OS XP through Windows 7. We know it's uh, for those of you who are joining us from a variety of uh, or nonprofits that are larger or library systems where you may have 
chapters with 200 different machines or 500 different machines. You may be running a third of them on Windows Vista or Windows 7, and another third of them on Windows 8. Uh, so we know that it can depend. And then there are some of you who may have five machines only that you are running, and, and those machines may all be upgraded or they may not. So that's what this event is here to help us figure out which ones are best for your needs. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. We have a little bit more than 115 people on the event today. And it looks like the great majority of you are still running Windows 7. It was a good operating system, isn't it? That's actually what we're running mostly here at TechSoup Global. So, uh, but with plans to upgrade soon, I hear. Uh, and then we've got about 30% running Windows 8 or 8.1. And then 17% of you have made the, the leap to Windows 10, which was released July 29th, and it came to the Volume Licensing Service Center on August 3rd. So we'll talk more about how to get it if you're interested in getting it, and some of those features that you can look forward to starting now. So thank you for taking part in that survey. I'd like to go ahead and welcome Anthony Kinsey to the program to talk to us about Windows 10 for nonprofits and libraries. And he'll be highlighting some of the features that we think are most likely the most relevant to your organizational needs and how you can work better, more efficiently, save money, save time, save battery life if you're using old hardware, whether it will work for you or not, things like that. We'll try and help answer those kinds of questions today on this webinar. And then we'll also again have Carlos later talk about those upgrade options. So welcome to the program, Anthony. We're so glad to have you. Hi everyone. I'm Anthony Kinsey. Um, I'm a software engineer up on the Windows team at Microsoft. Um, and I actually uh, work on an, an, a team called Customer Engagement where we try and get uh, different engineers and program managers from across the teams working on Windows, and we try and get them to go out and, and talk to customers and engage with them and listen and respond. And so we're taking a slightly different approach with this webinar uh, where I'm an actual engineer working on Windows, um, and I'm coming in to, to kind of give you guys some highlights of Windows 10 uh, from a nonprofit and library perspective. Um, and give you some reasons why, why I think you should upgrade. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter if, if you'd like, or feel free to uh, follow up with any questions on Twitter as well. Um, so as Becky mentioned, Windows 10 is off to a great start. It was released on uh, July 29th. Uh, since then, we have more than 75 million devices that have already upgraded to Windows 10. Uh, so that's an average of 2.5 million upgrades per day. So we've seen a great uptake in interest in Windows 10 since launch. Um, and we feel this is mostly because of the, the familiar and productive interface that you get in Windows 10. It's kind of the best of both worlds of Windows 7, Windows 8.1. Uh, I'll show a little bit more of that in the demo. Uh, but the reception from the press and from customers has been really great. Um, Windows 10 is running in, in 192 countries. So I think that's almost every country on the planet, even Antarctica. I think we're only missing like four countries or something like that. Uh, so we have kind of broad reach. A lot of people are using it across the world. Um, and one of the other uh, great reasons to upgrade to Windows 10 is that it works on a wide variety of, of devices and models. Uh, we've seen more than 90,000 unique PC or tablet models have already upgraded to Windows 10. Um, we're constantly working to get more devices upgraded and kind of working with the, the device manufacturers to make sure that their devices are, are ready to go, their drivers are ready, and things like that. Uh, we've even seen some devices that were manufactured all the way back in 2007 that have up upgraded to Windows 10. So it's really great to see that this new operating system is able to run on, on older hardware and still kind of uh, make it better. It's still running and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, so you can see some of the reviews from, from press has been pretty good. Uh, people are liking Windows 10. Uh, the press is liking it. Um, a lot of uh, uh, tech outlets are, are recommending to upgrade. And so uh, that's kind of why we've seen such great momentum kind of uh, getting out the gate. And we already have 75 million people using it um, and liking it. Um, so that's kind of some momentum of, of Windows 10. Uh, but on the agenda today, we'll talk about some of the features that I think are most relevant for nonprofits and libraries. Um, so we'll go over some of the security improvements in Windows 10, uh, some of the performance improvements, some demos of the actual features, um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about this new model that we've rolled out with Windows 10 uh, where it's kind of 
uh, you may have heard that Windows is a service now. And so I'll talk a little bit about that um, as well as some areas that you can go to get some additional support on Windows 10 if you've already made the upgrade or if you're planning on upgrading soon. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, the, the area I decided to start with was security. I think uh, security is a very important area for nonprofits and libraries. It's a very uh, increasingly important area across the industry. And so Windows 10 has, has played a, a lot of focus on security and making improvements to the space. Um, and so everybody probably knows, but the threat landscape out in, in technology and cyber security has changed uh, dramatically in recent years. Um, it seems almost every day we're hearing about some new company that uh, had something happen. They either got hacked or somehow their data got disclosed. And so with Windows 10, we're trying to kind of change the approach that we've been using with previous operating systems uh, so that we're not just kind of building up bigger walls, but we're actually changing the architecture so that uh, cyber criminals won't be able to get in. Um, and we're kind of using new defenses to keep them out. Um, and so the main areas of improvement are around these four areas, identity protection, data protection, and then protecting your device and while you're online. Uh, there's also this great spreadsheet online uh, that compares the Windows 10 versus the Windows 7 security features. So as I saw on the poll, lots of you guys are still on Windows 7, uh, but it's great to take a look at that spreadsheet and see some of the new capabilities that can really keep your machines a lot more secure kind of in the new era of cybersecurity that we're living in. Uh, I'll send out a link to that spreadsheet uh, in the notes, and then once you get a hold of these slides, uh, you can also go to the link as well. Um, so the first big area that they've uh, really come out with some cool new features on around security in Windows 10 is around identity protection. And so there's actually this new feature called Windows Hello that's kind of a new way to be able to log into your machine either using uh, various different biometrics, but things like your fingerprint or even your face or your, your eye scan. And so they're coming out with new cameras from Intel that are actually really cheap, uh, like an Intel RealSense camera. I think it only costs like 30 bucks. Uh, we can also use like the, the Kinect devices that Windows has come out with on the Xbox side. Uh, but this is actually a, a little camera that sits on your machine or if your laptop already has one, and it's kind of uh, looking for you and it can log you in based on your face. And so it's actually a really cool new technology. Hopefully you get to try it out sometime. Uh, but there's actually this cool article that just came out a few days ago uh, where they did some tests to see if identical twins could fool this system uh, because there's lots of questions and concerns around uh, would people just be able to hold up a picture of me and be able to log in or would my twin be able to log in and things like that. And the answer is, is no, that the system is actually able to distinguish between uh, even identical twins um, if it holds up a paper, it's actually doing some, some depth, depth scanning. So it's actually really secure. It's a lot more secure than passwords. Um, and so the hope is that in the future with this new kinds of technology coming out, uh, people won't have to remember tons of different passwords, but you'll kind of just be able to log in with your face or your fingerprint. And then the second part of identity protection um, is this new feature called Microsoft Passport. And basically after you've set up Windows Hello with your face or your fingerprint, then Microsoft Passport remembers your credentials uh, and then you can basically log into websites and apps using Windows Hello, using the, the fingerprint or the face recognition instead of having to remember your password for every site. Um, and so I actually just got one of these cameras here in my office. Um, and I think it's really awesome. Basically you just sit down at your desk, it sees you there, and then it automatically logs you in. And so it's super secure. Uh, you don't have to remember your password and change your password every couple months or something like that. Um, and so that's a really cool new feature that it does require some new hardware, uh, but it kind of shows some of the new innovative features that Microsoft is working on uh, to kind of um, make it so that employees and companies don't have to remember so many different passwords. And we kind of have this more secure method for logging in. Uh, you do need a special camera that has depth sensing. But most of the new cameras coming out will have that built in. Um, as I said, you can also buy the, the camera from Intel. and It's like 30 bucks or something. Uh, but it does give you a ton of convenience. It's more secure. Um, and so it's definitely something to look into. Um, the next area that they've upgraded for security or they've come out with new features is this uh, concept of enterprise data protection. And so with trends in the workplace like bring your own device, uh, you may have heard of BYOD, 
Um, employees are bringing in more of their own devices or, or companies are assigning out a single device and the employee is using that for both business and personal use. And so uh, I can say I do that on my own devices as well. I only have one laptop. I use it for work and for personal. Uh, but the, the concern and the risk here is that 57% 57 of us have actually sent data to the wrong person in the past. And so even if we don't have a malicious person uh, trying to, to leak the data, sometimes it just happens accidentally. And so enterprise data protection, uh, EDP, it can help with that kind of thing. It's a new system built into Windows 10 uh, where it can actually identify what's business data versus what's personal data and it automatically keeps them separate. And so it knows certain uh, apps or, or programs that you're using, those are for your business and so it's going to keep all the data from those apps kind of locked down, secured away from uh, your personal data kind of for your own apps that you're logged into or your own email accounts and things like that. Um, so it separates the data. Um, it also allows you to encrypt all the data up to the file level. Um, so it can encrypt everything on the device. Even if you have things on the SD card plugged into the device, it can encrypt the files over there. And so it kind of gives you that encryption so that even if the data were to go out accidentally, uh, the people on the other side wouldn't be able to open it up unless they have the right credentials or the right security clearance, that type of thing. Um, this also gives you data protection for your existing, if you have any business apps. Uh, you don't need to update them. This kind of just works automatically. It can identify the data and keep it securely separated. Um, this also gives you the, the ability to wipe business data from devices. Uh, so if a device got lost or it got stolen or something like that, uh, you can remotely kind of delete everything off of it so you don't have to worry about someone getting into that data. Um, you can just get a new device and, and start going again. Um, this also provides some audit reports. So if you have a, a few machines or lots of machines and you want to see what apps they're using, um, are any of the apps hitting errors or things like that, you can pull up these cool reports where you kind of see who's using which apps, which apps are being used the most often, are there any kind of actions that we should be taking to, to look into this error that we're seeing or something like that. Um, so it really gives you cool views in, across your kind of ecosystem of your devices um, and you can kind of see what, what apps are being used and things like that. Um, you can also select specific apps that can access business data. Um, so if we didn't automatically recognize it but you know that this is a, a one that you want to trust or business data that needs access, you can manually give it that access. And so you have these kind of uh, granular controls to decide uh, who gets access to what and then also keeping your business data separate from your personal data, keeping it all encrypted, um, and then that gives you a lot more security to make sure your, your data and your, uh, any of your intellectual property is not getting out into the wrong hands, uh, either accidentally or on purpose. Um, the, the next area uh, that we're still talking about security upgrades is around device and online protection. And so they've made a couple of key upgrades or key updates in these areas. Uh, protecting your device, they have this feature called Trusted Boot. This is actually an architectural change in Windows 10. So none of the previous versions have this. But this is kind of uh, working to prevent attackers from being able to load up uh, programs or even a full operating system onto your device kind of as you're booting up your machine. Those are some of the hardest uh, kind of hacks and things to detect because uh, they're basically loading up their own software before Windows even gets loaded. And so with this trusted boot, it's actually a new way at the hardware level of, of catching these attacks and, and kind of making sure that what's running on your machine is actually the genuine version of Windows. Uh, they weren't able to pop up something that looks like Windows but it's not quite or anything like that. And so any attacks where they're trying to run malicious code or they're trying to run something before the antivirus has had a chance to, to kick in, uh, this will catch those attacks and this will block them. And so uh, we did have some of these kinds of capabilities in previous versions of Windows, uh, but now it's been updated kind of at the, at the architectural level so that it prevents system tampering, uh, which is kind of one of the key new threats that we're seeing where people don't even know that their device has been compromised. Um, it could just be hacked and then they've been using it for a couple years without even realizing it. And so this will give a lot more protection in that area for your devices. Um, the second area is around protecting you while you're online. And so they have a new feature called Device Guard. And so this is a new, it's a firmware which is kind of like the, the software that runs at the hardware level on the device. And so this protects the device from running any 
unauthenticated or unauthorized software. It doesn't let it load. And so you can actually lock down the device fully if you want. Uh, you can say, I only want it to be able to run these apps or these scripts or be able to access these files. And so if you have public facing machines like at the library or something like that, uh, this is a key feature that you can use to really lock it down and make sure that uh, our customers or patrons are only using the apps that, that we've approved and that we kind of know that, that they're not going to mess anything up on the system. Um, even if the, the hacker does get in and one of the other ways they get a virus on the machine or something like that, uh, this device guard will still prevent them from running those viruses uh, because it kind of it knows what the, the white list of apps that it can allow through. And if it sees anything other than that, it will block it out. It will alert you about it. Um, and so it's a really cool new feature that kind of complements the existing antivirus uh, to catch some of these viruses that are hiding in different areas of the system uh, that antivirus doesn't always catch. Um, and so I pulled this little quote uh, from a TechRadar article, uh, but it talks about how DeviceGuard offers better malware protection uh, by basically allowing you to create a list of the apps that are allowed and the, the apps that you want to block out. And then anything that's new or unknown, it will kind of block it out and it will wait for you to tell it that it's okay to run it. Uh, so it's a really uh, cool new form of malware protection that's in Windows 10. Um, so from there, we'll go into talking about performance. Um, as I mentioned, Windows 10 runs great on older machines. Uh, we have 90,000 different models that we've been able to upgrade. Uh, there's even hardware from 2007 that's been getting upgraded improvements in their performance. And so it's really worth it to upgrade your older machines just to squeeze a little bit more life out of them. Um, and so there's actually this article that came up on uh, Ars Technica. They're a, a technical kind of review website. They do a lot of uh, comparisons on the actual hardware. Um, and so they waited for Windows 10 to be released to make sure that they're using the, the full version that every other customer is getting. And then they did these tests on some, uh, some new machines, some lower model tablets, and they compared these different kind of performance areas uh, across Windows 10 versus Windows 7. And so you can see um, it's a little bit small, but the, uh, over here on the left, uh, the faster boot time, so they were comparing, they took a Dell Latitude laptop, uh, kind of an older one, and then down here they took a Stream Mini, that's one of those new smaller tablets, like the handheld tablets. Um, and you can see that uh, the boot time has gone down significantly in Windows 10. And so for boot time, you actually want it to be less because that means your machine is booting up faster. So from the, the time you hit the power button to the time you're actually able to start using it, um, it's gone down by probably 30 to 50 percent on some of these smaller machines. Um, so you're able to boot up much faster, get things working. Uh, that's been kind of a, a big pain point in the past is that on some older machines, uh, you hit the start button and then you kind of have to go run and grab your coffee because it takes a couple minutes for it to really get started. Uh, they've made huge improvements in that space for Windows 10. Um, so you'll kind of be able to turn it on and get going a lot more, a lot more quickly. Um, the second area that they compared was around how much storage space uh, actually installing Windows takes on the machine, um, especially with some of these newer devices that are coming out like tablets and two-in-ones. They don't have as much storage space as our typical laptops do. And so uh, people really want to make sure that Windows isn't just taking up a ton of their space. If I buy a machine with 32 gigabyte hard drive on it, I want to make sure I have as much of that 32 gigabytes to use for my own stuff as possible. And so they've made a lot of improvements in Windows 10. Uh, to really get the amount of disk space down that we're using. Um, and so you can see um, on the, the blue line is Windows 10. Um, and so you can see that uh, like on Windows 7, the installation was taking 21 gigabytes or 23. Um, on Windows 8, it was taking like 33 gigabytes, and now we've gotten it down to 18. So it's taking even less space than Windows 7, still giving you all these new features. Uh, but it's, and it's kind of allowing you to use more space that you paid for on your device. Um, the last area that they compared was around performance and kind of how much memory is your machine using uh, when it's just sitting there idle. And so memory is one of the, the pieces of hardware you have in your computer uh, that kind of helps the system run when you're loading lots of apps and loading them into memory and things like that. Um, so you want to have more memory available so that your machine runs faster when you're loading up apps and things like that. And so on here, they compared that Dell machine, and they're showing that um, it's using 
uh, a few hundred, almost almost one gigabyte lower of, of memory at idle. And so that means that uh, if you bought a machine with four gigabytes of memory, you're having a whole quarter of that memory free to use uh, for your apps uh, that you wouldn't have had running Windows 7 on that, on that machine. And so that makes a huge difference kind of as you're working on the machine, as you're multitasking with lots of apps open and things like that. Uh, you're really going to notice this improved performance uh, that you get from Windows 10. Uh, so that was really cool to see that it's kind of a, a third-party tech outlet that's doing these comparisons, and they're kind of doing it in a really scientific way. Uh, so we're not messing with any of the numbers here. This is kind of showing uh, that the performance has improved. Um, and so with that, um, I'll get to some demos. I kind of wanted to go through some of the things that I'm not able to demo first. Um, I think those are really important areas uh, for nonprofits and libraries as a small business. Uh, you want to make sure that your devices are secure. You don't want to risk having your data leak out unintentionally. Um, and you also want to make sure you're kind of getting the best bang for buck uh, for your devices by getting the best performance. And so all of those things is, is kind of what you get with Windows 10. Um, and so from that, a uh, very timely question, Alexa. Um, I'll be going into some demos of the actual features um, in Windows or Windows 10. Um, and so I'll talk about the new start menu that's back. Um, I'll do a quick demo of searching Cortana. Uh, we have a new browser built into Windows 10 called Microsoft Edge. Uh, but don't worry, Internet Explorer is also there uh, if you really want to keep using that or you have applications that are dependent on that. Um, we also have some cool features called uh, multiple desktops and task view. I'll talk about that. And then also uh, OneDrive and OneDrive for business integration uh, directly into the file explorer. Uh, so with that, I'll switch over to my actual desktop. Um, and so you should be able to see my desktop now. Um, and so this is kind of what Windows 10 looks like. It's familiar with Windows 7. Um, and so you still see the taskbar. You, get, you land on the desktop. Um, lots of things are the same. You have the system tray down there. Um, you even have the start menu. That's back. This is one of the big changes from Windows 8. Uh, but they did keep the live tiles from Windows 8, and so you kind of still have some familiarity there uh, with Windows 8. Um, if you're on a tablet, they even have a, a feature called Tablet Mode, which is basically the same screen as Windows 8 where the tiles uh, can expand to take up the full screen. So if you really like the current Windows 8 setup with your tiles laid out, you can still get that set up. Uh, but if you're on a desktop or a laptop or, and you want the kind of traditional desktop, uh, that's all here along with your Start menu. Uh, you can pin all these tiles. You can make this bigger or smaller if you want more tiles or less tiles. Um, and so you can play around with it. You can pin new things, organize it. Um, you still have your All Apps menu like you had in Windows 7. So all, it looks a little bit different. It's organized a little bit. Uh, but it's all here. Uh, you can jump to different letters and things like that. Uh, so it should be pretty familiar if you're upgrading from Windows 7. Uh, you should still have the Start menu. All of your existing Start menu uh, setup should be carried over and things like that. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the new Start menu. You may have noticed down here uh, there's also this new Search Bar. And so this is uh, the Search Bar, and it's also Cortana. Uh, so you may have heard about Cortana. Cortana is a, a personal assistant that's built into Windows 10. And so it's basically uh, going to help you with your day. It's going to show you what's on your calendar. Um, you can kind of tell it what news you're interested in. Uh, if you're interested in any sports or following certain companies, things like that, um, you can definitely customize what it's showing you. Over time, it's kind of uh, learning what kinds of information you want to have it show. Um, and you can always go into, they call it the journal, but you can always go in, see what information it's kind of uh, recording about you. And you can uh, delete things or add things to help it uh, know more about you. Uh, but it can do some awesome things like track your flight departures. It will pop up reminders about it um, and all that kind of thing. Um, and so this is kind of just built in. It's a way to, to get you ready for your day. Uh, but you can also use this as a search box for searching across Windows. Um, so you can just say, uh, I want to find my documents. Uh, you, can, you can talk to Cortana, but you can also just type to it. So if you're in a, in a busy office setting and you don't want to to speak up or to speak out and kind of bother everybody, you can just talk to it and say, when is my next available appointment? And then it's going to bring up your calendar. Um, it's going to show you uh, your next event 
and then you can kind of plan around that. Uh, you can ask it other things to just bring up your full day schedule and things like that. Uh, you could say, what's the weather today? Um, and then it's going to show you the weather, things like that. And so it's really kind of a contextual inquiry that you can do. Um, if it can answer it right away, it'll just pop up the answer. If it's some files on your machine, it'll pop it up. Um, if it can't find anything right away, then it will uh, search on the, on the Internet. And so uh, you can also do business type things. Like if, say you were working on a PDF recently, uh, but you're not sure where exactly you put it. Uh, you could say, show me PDFs. And this will kind of bring up all the PDFs on your device. Uh, but maybe you're not sure. Like I, I know I was working on it in the last two weeks, uh, but I'm not sure exactly where it was. Uh, you can say, show me all the PDFs from last week, and now it's only showing me the ones that I've worked on in, in the last week or so. And so you can do some questions like this to really kind of uh, ask Cortana some questions. She can help you find stuff on the computer, find stuff on the web. Um, she can even answer some stuff right, in, right inside her little box. Um, so it's definitely a powerful tool. Uh, say I did find what I was looking for. You can even set reminders in here. Uh, so you can be like, remind me to send PDF to Tom uh, next Tuesday, 5 p.m. Um, and this is actually easier to do by talking, uh, but since I'm talking to you guys, I'll just type it in. Uh, but you can set these kinds of reminders. Uh, you can easily customize it. And then this is just going to, and then you're done. It set the alarm, and then uh, next Tuesday at 5 p.m., it's going to remind me to send this out. And so kind of as you're working, as you're remembering things that you need to get done, you can set these little reminders, and you can kind of leverage Cortana to, to help you throughout your day. Uh, so that's kind of just the, the tip of the iceberg with Cortana. There's lots of cool stuff you can do there. Uh, but uh, definitely encourage you to, to kind of play around with Cortana. Uh, she's actually going out if you have phone devices. Uh, she's on iOS and Android and on Windows Phone. Uh, so you can get her on, on other devices. It will sync your notifications and reminders from your desktop to your other devices. Um, so lots of cool ways that you can leverage Cortana to kind of help you throughout your daily workflow. Great. Anthony, before we move off of Cortana, we had a question from Susan saying, when she searches, it's only searching the Internet, um, not her stuff, not her PC. Is there a setting she can change so that it just searches wherever? Um, so I think if you search for certain things, there's these little uh, boxes down at the bottom where you can select if I only wanted to search stuff on my computer, or if I wanted to search the full web. And so if you want to force it to only search on your computer, uh, you should be able to click that My Stuff box, and now it's only searching stuff on your computer, not on the web. Uh, so look for that little box, and that, that should enable you to do it. Great. Thanks yeah. for that. Okay, so next uh, I wanted to talk about the new browser that's built into Windows 10. Um, so this is called Microsoft Edge. And so they basically created a new browser kind of from the ground up to make it really fast, a uh, really kind of clean interface. And they wanted to make it kind of a modern browser that's built for the modern web. And so you have lots of cool things in here. Uh, uh, this is just the home page where it's bringing you up. Uh, you can kind of set what shows down here if you wanted to show you some quick news. Or you can just go to, to any page on here uh, from the start bar. Uh, you can even, there's Cortana integrated into the browser. Uh, so you can even search for things. If you're already in the browser and you just want to see uh, what's the weather in Seattle, uh, so you can see it right there. It kind of just pops it up in the bar. You can see Cortana is showing me this. Um, so you can click on that, go to more results. Uh, you can even ask uh, or say, so I went here and now I see something interesting or I, I want to share this out with, with my wife because, oh, it's going to be rainy this weekend. I want her to know about it. Uh, so one of the new features in Edge is actually what they call a web note. Uh, so you can click this button, and now you can actually write directly on, on the web page, and you can take some notes. And so I could say, hey, look, it's going to be raining this weekend. Maybe we need to cancel our camping plans. Uh, once you've done it, you can either save it out as an image to send to people, or you can actually just share it straight from, from Windows. Um, and so I could say, I want to send this out through my account. Uh, I'm going to send it to my wife and say, hey, we should cancel these plans or something like that. Um, and so you can see in the little image, it's taking the full web page. It's showing what I wrote on the web page. And so you can really do some interesting things with taking notes directly on the web page. Uh, you can write things. You can annotate things. 
add a little box, a comment, things like that. And so you can really just mark up directly on the web page, uh, send that over to your colleague or whoever, have them see your notes, and they kind of get the full context of what you were looking at, uh, what you were highlighting, and everything like that. Uh, so that's a really cool new feature with being able to write directly on the web. If you have a, a pen or something or a stylus, uh, that's really nice for being able to, to write notes directly on the web page. Um, another thing that you can do is say you saw an interesting article in here, uh, but I don't have time to read it now. I kind of want to go uh, read it later. And so uh, you can go in here and they have this new reading list that's built in uh, to the browser. And so anything that, that you see that's interesting, you don't have time to follow up on it now, but you want to keep it for kind of later, you can just add it to your reading list. Um, and then from then on, you'll always be able to see it in here. Uh, this reading list also syncs across devices. So if you have a Windows phone, you'd be able to check your list uh, from your phone and kind of see uh, what's the latest article that you want to catch up on and things like that. Um, one of the last features that I wanted to show was uh, another one showing kind of how uh, Cortana is integrated in. Uh, so say you are looking at uh, some place that you want to book some travel, you're doing a business trip or something like that, uh, but you want to find out a little bit more information about the place, uh, you can actually uh, ask Cortana about any of the terms you're seeing on the web page. So you can just highlight that. Uh, you can say, ask Cortana. She's going to look up Costa Rica, and then she's bringing me up a bunch of details about Costa Rica, uh, where it's at, how do I get there, some travel tips, points of interest, all that kind of thing. And so without kind of losing your context of what you're doing on the web page, you can get some additional details from Cortana and kind of drill in there, see what's going on. Uh, this works on people, places, all kinds of things. Uh, so it's a really powerful way to kind of get some additional information without leaving your web page, without having to load up a new tab or anything like that. Uh, you can just highlight and right click, ask Cortana. Um, and so that's kind of the, the Edge browser. Um, you kind of have to try it out to really see how fast it is, how smooth it is, uh, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, it kind of leaves uh, some of our old browsers in the dust a little bit on some of the, the cool things it can do and how fast it does it. Uh, but say you have a, an Internet application that uh, you're not sure if it's going to work with the new browser or you don't kind of want to spend the money to update your application. Uh, the, the old Internet Explorer browser is still here. It still works. Uh, they're still supporting it. And so you can do all of the same stuff that you've been doing with the Internet Explorer browser uh, through this version. And so you kind of have the choice now. Uh, you can use the new faster browser uh, for some more lightweight browsing. Uh, but if you kind of need to run those older applications or older websites that might have some compatibility issues, uh, you can still load them up in Internet Explorer and you still get everything that you had in the previous versions of Windows. Um, and so that's kind of the new browsers in the build uh, or in, the, in Windows 10. Uh, another new feature that we have that's really good if you're kind of, if you like to have lots of Windows open, if you're kind of working across multiple desktops, and you like to keep everything kind of arranged, uh, they have this new thing called Task View uh, where you can go in and it will show you all the open tasks. Uh, so if I had a few things opened in here, uh, I'd be able to go into Task View. And then it's kind of a, a visual way that you can switch between the open applications. You can see, oh, I wanted to go to this one. And so it's kind of an easy way to switch between the applications. Uh, you can use your uh, touch to, to hit the button. You can use your mouse. You can switch between. Uh, but another really cool thing is that you can actually create multiple desktops now. And so say I'm, using, I'm doing a lot of research uh, and I kind of want to switch over to check my mail, but I don't want to lose all of my web pages that I have open and I kind of have them arranged. Um, so you can actually just switch over to a new desktop and this will be like a brand new slate kind of. And so you could have a bunch of different, uh, I think you can have a bunch of different pages open over here. And so you could be doing different things, looking at your Excel worksheet, uh, looking at your file folder, and then you can leave them all up on the screen, uh, switch back to that other desktop. And so you can kind of have these different workspaces where you can keep uh, your one type of work separate on that other desktop. Maybe you keep your personal stuff over on this other desktop, uh, but it gives you a lot more flexibility to kind of decide how you want to organize things, uh, where you want to put them, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Another new feature that they have is that now there's actually a notification center built into Windows 10. Uh, so you'll see over here the little notification icon down in the right. 
And so anytime that you get a, a pop-up uh, while you're using Windows, say you get a pop-up from your uh, mail application saying you have mail, or maybe sometimes you just get these little annoying pop-ups from Windows saying you need to do something or you need to run a scan, uh, those will all be saved for you. So if you kind of miss the pop-up right when it pops up or it wasn't a convenient time to look into it, you can still keep track of it. You can look into it later. Uh, you can see what's been popping up. Um, and then you can just clear everything out or you can clear them out individually. And so things like your latest emails will be showing up in there and all that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of a, similar to what most people have on their phones where you can kind of glance at what the latest emails or notifications from your social networks or something like that are. You can kind of see them all in this action center and then quickly uh, clear them out or take action on them. Uh, you also get these new uh, quick actions here. You can quickly uh, switch into tablet mode, connect to a, a monitor or a different device, uh, take a note, or go into the settings and change things around there. Uh, so that's kind of a, a new way that kind of makes it a lot easier to keep track of, of notifications that are popping up on your device. Um, and the final thing I wanted to demo is that uh, with Windows 10, uh, OneDrive and OneDrive for Business are, are kind of heavily integrated into the File Explorer to make it really easy for you to be able to drop things into your OneDrive, uh, share them out. I think there's also uh, support for other cloud services, so I think you can get like Box in here if you use Box and things like that, or, or Dropbox. Um, and so uh, you can see this just looks like any other folder on my machine. Uh, it's just it's sitting in my File Explorer. I can drop files in here. I can share them out with people, and so it's all kind of built in. Uh, you don't need to go to a separate app or to a website. You can still do those things, uh, but the hope is that by just integrating it into, into File Explorer, it will make it a lot easier to kind of use this as part of your workflow. Uh, you can just drop things in here, share them out, control who has access to what. And so that's kind of an easy way to make sure uh, when I go home for the night, if I'm logging on my work machine, um, I'll still be able to access all of these files because they're on my cloud storage. Um, and so when I go home, I'll be able to look in the same folder. They'll all be there. They'll be synced up. Um, and so that's a kind of easy way to keep track of what's going on. Um, and so with that, I think I'm taking up a little bit more time, so I'll try and go quickly through the last couple of slides that I have. Uh, that was kind of a demo of the new features on Windows 10, um, in addition to kind of the security and performance improvements that I also talked about. But one of the other big changes with Windows 10 is that uh, you may have heard this, but when we're kind of trying to uh, make Windows into a service now where instead of doing these big releases every few years, uh, we're starting, starting to do these more uh, smaller continuous updates over time uh, where we're just trying to give everybody the latest features, fix the bugs a, a bit faster than we have in the past, and then we're kind of constantly getting the, the newest and good stuff out to people as quickly as possible. And so you can kind of see in this diagram, uh, we have a system where we try out all the new, the new versions of Windows inside of Microsoft first, and so all the engineering teams are working on it. They're fixing the top bugs and things like that. Uh, then it goes out to the rest of Microsoft to try it. So there's tens of thousands of people trying it. Once they kind of give the, the thumbs up, uh, then it goes out to our Windows insiders, which are people that have signed up to kind of test out the latest builds uh, before they're fully released. Um, and then once we kind of have several million people testing it out, we've ironed out the, the latest bugs or anything like that, uh, then we actually send it out to everybody on the current branch, uh, which is just normal customers out there that are uh, on Windows 10. And then businesses actually have the option to, to get it even later than that. And so you can kind of wait up to 12 months uh, as these new updates are coming out. You can decide if you want to take them or not. Uh, but you do have the benefit that uh, hundreds of millions of people will have tested out those builds before they get offered to your machine. And so you'll have a much uh, higher likelihood of, of having a good upgrade experience because it's been tested by so many people, uh, which is a big change from how we've done it in the past uh, where it kind of only got tested within Microsoft before we release it to everyone. Now it's kind of going through these stages where it gets tested more and more before it actually gets offered out to business customers. Um, and so a couple things on support. So I know you guys are nonprofits and libraries, so I'm not sure if you guys get uh, kind of the paid support through TechNet and things like that. Uh, but I wanted to call out that we do have new areas that we're focusing on to provide uh, free support to our customers. And so you can actually go to the Microsoft Community Forums and report a problem or start a discussion on something that you're seeing in Windows. Uh, if you just want to know why, it, why a change was made or why something works the way it does, you can ask us those questions. Um, if you're seeing a, a bug, you can report it to us there. 
And so uh, we have real engineers and program managers from across the teams that are, are answering questions there, that are responding to the, the questions and posts from customers. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to get out there if you have any questions, uh, kind of participate in that community. Uh, you can also tweet at us on Twitter. So you can tweet to Microsoft Helps or at Windows. Uh, they'll get you help. They'll direct you to if there's any kind of help documentation that can help you. Or they might shoot you over to one of our engineers who can dig in a bit further and get you the help you need. Uh, so just wanted to call out that there are these kind of new areas that are, are, are free ways to get support. Um, and we do have engineers and PMs on there, which we didn't in the past. And so that's kind of a new thing we're doing with Windows 10 to try and get you uh, better support and be able to address your issues uh, more quickly. Um, so one of the last things I wanted to mention is that, uh, so the name of this uh, webinar was Upgrade Your World. And so there's actually an Upgrade Your World initiative that uh, Microsoft has been rolling out. Uh, they started uh, last month when we launched Windows 10. And so they actually had a, a contest for global nonprofits that are operating in more than one country uh, to be able to try and get people to vote for them and then they could win a cash investment. Uh, but there's actually, that one ended a few days ago and there's a new contest starting up on September 1st uh, for local nonprofits who are just operating in a single country. Uh, so if you operate in any of these uh, 10 countries, you'll be eligible for that contest. Um, and so the details haven't been released yet. Uh, but the winner will be able to receive a cash investment of $50,000, a bunch of free technology. Uh, so I definitely encourage going to check out this website on September 1st uh, for the details of how that's going to work. Uh, if you want to get a heads up, you can email this alias and they might be able to get you some early details on what that contest will look like. Uh, but definitely a great opportunity to, to get some more support, uh, some cash and some technology from Microsoft. Um, and so with that, I have a few additional resources. I'm kind of over time, so I won't go through these, but we'll send out these links uh, in, in the follow-up mail so you guys will have all these. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Carlos, uh, who will talk to you about how to actually get the upgrade as a nonprofit. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. And yeah, let's have Carlos talk about the upgrade options. Some of you can do it for free. Some of you uh, can do it for free through the Volume Licensing Center. Some of you may have to pay for it. And some of you can probably get it through our donation program. So talk to us about how to get it. Absolutely. And I saw some questions in the, the, the chat there that will be answered very shortly. Um, so let's start here, the upgrade options. So. These are the three sort of common scenarios. And you know, yes, the upgrade to Windows 10 is free if you have Windows 7 or 8. Um, but I want to go over a different scenario first, which is uh, if you have active software assurance for your Windows licenses. Um, so these are the three scenarios we're going to look at. If you have software assurance, if you don't have software assurance, but you have Windows 7 or 8 or 8.1, same thing. Or if you don't have active software assurance, and you have an older version of Windows than 7 such as XP or Vista or 98, something like that. Um, the reason I'm going over the software assurance scenario first is because it's important to upgrade using your software insurance if you have it. Um, so if you have active software assurance, which a lot of people who come through TechSoup and request Windows as a donation, do you get software assurance automatically. Um, it allows you to upgrade to a new version of the software that's released two years after you uh, have requested it. So this applies to all Microsoft software, and Windows is no exception. Um, so if you requested a Windows Upgrade License through TechSoup after August 3, 2013, you should have active software assurance for that license, um, and you should be able to download the upgrade to Windows 10 for free through the VLSC. Um, if you are familiar with TechSoup, you've probably used the VLSC before. It's how you get your donations. Um, we have some guides about how to do it, but basically it's at the VLSC. You go to Downloads and Keys, and it will just show up there. Um, if you're worried about, you know, how do I know what date I received it, if it's August 3rd or if it was after or before, you can actually just go to the VLSC and look. If it's there, it means you have a license for it. If it's not, then you don't. So you don't have to worry too much about the actual date. Um, just check the VLSC. And if, if you're unsure, I would encourage you to do that first so you know. Um, here's a kind of showing on TechSoup where you can get information about help downloading software from the VLSC because it can be a little complicated. On our support tab on our website, we have a page called Microsoft Download Help. Um, and 
think it's step three there, it, really, it goes over exactly how to download that software. And it's basically what I mentioned before, going to the VLSC, logging in, going to product uh, downloads and keys. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing actually. Let's see. Oh, the reason you want to do that is because um, if you have Active Software Assurance and you use one of these other free routes that we're about to go over, um, your license is replaced by this, this free upgrade license, which is a different license and doesn't include Software Assurance. Um, some of the benefits you can get from Software Assurance are e-learning courses. So there probably will be courses about how to use Windows 10. There are courses about how to use Office 2013 and that kind of thing that you get from Software Assurance automatically. You also have um, the ability to download the enterprise version of Windows, and that includes Windows 10. And the only way to do that is to go through the VLSC um, or, and request it to request it through TechSoup, or if you if you actually have Software Assurance. Um, so that's why I'm stressing. You know, if you have Software Assurance, go go to the VLSC and and, and make sure you can download it there first. The next scenario is if you don't have Software Assurance. So you checked, or maybe you're new to TechSoup and you you're definitely sure that you haven't requested it. This is something that's open to everyone in the world, not specifically nonprofits. Um, upgrades to Windows 10 are free if you have Windows 7 or 8 or 8.1. Um, you can upgrade any time before July 29, 2016. After that day, you're going to have to pay. Um, if you're a nonprofit, you could get it through TechSoup after that day and you know, only pay the admin fee. But still, if you can get it free, you might as well. Um, I'll go over in a second what you can actually get because you can what edition you can upgrade to. Um, if you want to get the enterprise edition, this is like I mentioned before, you have to go through TechSoup if you are a nonprofit and you're eligible for donations through TechSoup. That's the only way to get it. Um, y even if you have an older enterprise edition with expired software assurance or something like that, um, and you want to get the enterprise edition, you've got to re request an upgrade license through TechSoup. Um, I have a link here which is an overview page about upgrade options. Um, here's a slide. So this is on the page that I linked that actually tells you, you know, what you can, what edition you can get because there were a lot of different editions for 7 and 8. So for example, Starter, Home Basic, and Home Premium are all grouped together. If you have one of those, um, you can get Windows 10 Home Edition. Professional and Ultimate are grouped together, and you can get Pro. As I mentioned before, Enterprise isn't listed on here because that's only through uh, Software Assurance and the VLSC. Um, so you can't actually upgrade. If you have Home Basic, you can't get Pro unless you request an upgrade license. You can, you can only get the edition that lists here. Um, same thing goes for Windows 8. We have those listed here. It was a little simpler because Windows 8 didn't have Home or Standard. It just had a Windows 8 Pro and um, Enterprise, which again isn't here. But this tells you exactly what you need to know about the additions you can get. Um, so again, if you want to upgrade, you request an upgrade license through TechSoup, and you can get it that way. The third scenario, so which a lot of people probably are in, um, you don't have software assurance for your Windows license, and you don't have a version uh, of Windows that's 7 or 8 or 8.1. So XP, Vista, 98, 95. Um, what you have to do is sign up for TechSoup if you haven't already and request an upgrade license. That will be the most common. Or a full operating system license uh, that's called a Get Genuine license. So we have a special program called the Get Genuine program that is available for people who have Windows licenses that aren't eligible for the upgrade license. Uh, the reason is the upgrade license, you have to have certain editions of Windows to be eligible for it. So for example, the Home Edition or the Starter Edition of Windows, even if it's for Windows XP, is not eligible for uh, an upgrade license. Um, however, if you have XP you know, Professional or something like that, you are eligible for the upgrade license. Um, so check the system requirements. I can go over here. Oh, this is a link. So I have there's a blog post on TechSoup right now. Um, here's a link here, or you can just go to TechSoup and go to the blog and search for the Windows a recent post 
called Get Windows 10 for Your Organization. Uh, it has a very detailed table about ev listing every, pretty much every possible edition you could have. Uh, this is just the top of it. You'll, it goes on for a while and it lists 98, 95, even older versions of Windows that a lot of people probably don't have, but just to let you know exactly what you should do and the, the best way, or if, if you have an option, sort of what your options are about getting your Windows upgrade. Um, this information is also available on Microsoft's site. This is the Upgrade Your World site. It is a little more broad, so it, it, it has the same information basically, but it doesn't get in specific about whether you need the regular upgrade from us, the upgrade product, or the Get Genuine product. Um, something I will mention about the, the Get Genuine product is uh, that the Get Genuine product, you can only it, it's a special, it's kind of a sub-program in a Microsoft Donation Program. So it's a special program and you can only replace requests for it one time ever, which is kind of unusual for the Microsoft program. Most any anything else in the Microsoft program you can request during your your um, Every two years, you can place new requests. Um, with, with Get Genuine, you can only just place place one request, and that's it. And, and that is because it is to uh, it was in, it's a full version, and it was introduced to correct scenarios where you have life, um, ineligible licenses, basically. So it's not just for people who have the Home Edition of Windows; it's also for people who have, you know, um, an, an unauthorized version of Windows or a different operating system or um, other operating systems that aren't Windows even. Um, so that's the reason that's like that. And another thing to note about the, the Get Genuine program is e it is a full operating system as opposed to the upgrade. Um, but unlike the upgrade product, it is only the Pro edition. So the, with, the, with the Windows operating system upgrade through TechSoup, and I'm, I'm showing on this page you can search for Windows or Windows 10, and these, these products should show up. With that upgrade through TechSoup, you know it, it doesn't actually show the edition on here, and that's because with with all Microsoft products, you can choose to download the most current edition or one edition, or sorry, the most current version or one recent, um, the the most recent prior version, and you can also choose with Windows in particular to get Pro or Enterprise, um, but that only applies to the upgrade. Get Genuine is a special program, and it allows you to get the full operating system just one time, like I mentioned. But it's only for the Pro operating system. Um, so if you're in a scenario where you want, this is again, this is explained on the on the blog post. There's a chart there. If you're in a scenario where you have you you have a, a a version of Windows that's not licensed or it's not authorized, and you need to get, or you have a Home Edition and you and you need to get Windows 10, and you want to get Enterprise, for instance, it's a it's a two-step process. So you would have to get uh, the full operating system first to get genuine license to get Pro, and then request an upgrade through us to get the Enterprise Edition. Um, one last thing about Get Genuine because it is a little little complex. Get Genuine does not include software assurance, um, so that's another reason why you have to do that last step that I mentioned. Um, the Enterprise Edition is, is part of the VLC. It's part of a software assurance benefit, um, so you won't get that if you only request. Get genuine. You, you'll get Windows 10 Pro, but it won't have software assurance, so you won't be getting the uh, two-year window of free of free upgrades that you would through any other Microsoft product through the catalog or the regular Windows operating system upgrade product. Um, this last slide, I have several links. So these are links for basically the, the same links that I went over before. Um, What's new in Windows 10 is an article we have on TechSoup right now that explains goes over some of the things that. Uh, you saw earlier about what's new in the interface. Um, Get Windows 10 for your organization is the blog post. Uh, Microsoft Download Help is where you can find in the, the TechSoup support tab about how to actually download software that you've requested through TechSoup that's from the Microsoft VLC, or just a reminder if you've done it before, how to check to see if you've got Windows 10 already um, queued up there. Um, the last, I have a link for Windows Tech Center here because I wanted to mention there's some new things for uh, Windows for Business. There's a, a service called Windows Update for Business that um, if you have an IT department, they will probably be interested. But um, for many of you who have Windows 7 or 8 and you're at a small organization, you, you might have noticed that the Windows uh, 10 up free upgrade just pops up in the bottom of your system tray in Windows, and it says, "Hey, your your upgrade is ready." And it 
it said that, I think started saying that a month or so before it came out because it was downloading it in advance. Um, if it didn't do that, you can, you can go to these, uh, the Microsoft link that I have here, let me see, um, Get Windows Temp Your Organization, or sorry, that's the blog post. The Upgrade Your World should have that information um, about how to actually get it, and it should let you know, you know what happens if that, thing, if that, that icon doesn't pop up about getting my free, uh, free upgrade. Um, but for a lot of people, if you actually have an IT department and if you have Windows Server, um, it's likely that they are, they are controlling your upgrades, so they don't allow everyone to upgrade. And uh, Windows up, up, Update for Business is a new service that allows them a little more control over that. So they might be rolling out your upgrades over a period of time or later on. Um, but yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a new service. And most, but most of you have small organizations. If you don't, you probably know if you have an IT department or not. And if you don't, then you're upgrading your own com your computers on your own. Then you know you'll be doing it manually. So follow the steps that I showed you, or, or go to the blog for more information. Great, thank you for that, Carlos. I realize we're over time here, so I chatted out to let folks know that we wouldn't be able to do questions right now. Um, so I want to just point people to a couple of resources before we wrap up. Uh, you can continue asking questions in our databases and software forum, which is this bit.ly link here that uh, we'll chat out into the window for you. And we'll include that in the follow-up email as well. Anthony also shared some resources on where you can go to the forums and Twitter handles that are used by Microsoft engineers to get specific answers. There were some very specific ones asked in the, in the Q&A that we won't have time to get into today. I will try and follow up with any that I think we can answer quickly after the fact. So watch for an email from me if you have a question that uh, is in the queue right now. Go ahead and chat in to let us know one thing you learned today and think is valuable that you will try and implement or that you are going to take back to your organization to determine whether you want to move up to Windows 10 or maybe you are already using it and what you might do better. For those of you who are interested, know that you will get an email from me that includes the full recording that you can watch at your convenience. You can go over any parts that you might have missed or look more closely in full screen. Uh, you will get all of that from me including the PowerPoint deck and um, all of the links that were shared will be in that follow-up email as well. So watch for that. I'd also like to invite you to join us for any upcoming webinars and events that we have coming up. We will be talking about Giving Tuesday and tactical tips for using that. And that's that Tuesday after Black Friday, Thanksgiving weekend, where nonprofits are using that as a date to bring in lots of end-of-year fundraising uh, money. So join us for info about that. If you are with a library, we will be talking about managing mobile devices and how to check out devices at your library. Then we will be talking about getting started, how to make your grant request sparkle on the 17th. And then we will be joined by folks from Good360, Independent Sector, and maybe even Journey Ed to talk about donated and discounted technologies available to nonprofits and libraries, including and beyond TechSoup's programs. So watch for more from us coming soon. Thank you to Anthony for taking the time today, and Carlos as well for sharing your expertise. I'm sorry we didn't have time and we went a little bit over. Join us at TechSoup Global, TechSoup.org, and on our Facebook and Twitter channels. Thank you also to ReadyTalk for providing the use of this platform so we can present webinars on a regular basis. Please complete the post-event survey that will pop up when you close out of today's webinar to help us continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.